Let's go straight to Rachel Blevins, journalist, political commentator, and one of our most popular guests on the mother of all talk shows. Rachel, uh, we might have been, but for a fraction of an inch, about half an inch, they say, uh, having a very different conversation tonight. If we were indeed able to do it, a state of martial law might have had to be declared in your country, but for a half an inch. That's a pretty narrow escape, isn't it? Oh, it definitely is. And I think everyone is still kind of in shock right now. I mean, for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about Joe Biden, right? Can he run? Is he up to the task? Is someone going to replace him? And Donald Trump has been the most sure candidate, right? We've watched him go through all of these different, uh, well, charges, at least one or two trials there with a couple more coming up. But all of this talk and all of this rhetoric has been that Trump is the dangerous candidate, that he is a threat to democracy, that we have to stop him from making it to election day. And so I know that there has been a lot of talk out there, just like what we saw with Robert Fizzo just a couple of months ago. The speculation has been that someone, some deranged person could be driven to the point where they take all of those warnings, they take it seriously, and they attempt to end Trump's life altogether. Now, I know that there's a, specul a lot of speculation out there. I have been reading opinions and comments all over the place as to what actually led up to this, whether it was the Secret Service failure of the century, whether there was some sort of deep state element that was in on it. And unfortunately, when it comes to things like this, I feel like the answer is that here in the United States, we may never know. I mean, we're not allowed to talk about JFK, right? We know that in a lot of cases, obviously, there was security there. There was Secret Service on the roof that took out what they are claiming is the shooter. But then we also have those people on the ground that say, hey, we saw a man on a roof with the rifle. We reported this to the police. And on top of that, unfortunately, we know that there are a number of different layers of police. So it brings up the question of, was this just a complete failure where you had local law enforcement who were supposed to be securing a certain area and they didn't, they failed to communicate with the service? Or is there more to it and does it get a lot more diabolical than that? And I know we are still just in the first 24 hours of this, but a lot of very serious questions here. Well, uh, sh you say shocked and that's right, but not surprised, right? I have been predicting this very thing on this show and elsewhere for at least one year. I have repeatedly urged on here Trump to get rid of the Secret Service bodyguard, get a Russian set of bodyguards, hire anybody other than the people that were, from my point of view, certainly involved in the murders of JFK, of MLK, of Malcolm X, and of RFK. Uh, the, the, the truth is, the last people in the world you should look to to secure you from this kind of event are the three-letter agencies in the United States who are most afraid of you. Oh, I would agree with you on that one. I mean, I think that Trump has got to be waking up today, happy to be alive, but also looking around at every single Secret Service agent that is around him and wondering, OK, how do we proceed? And, you know, it's been interesting to see some of the speculation on social media. You've got people claiming that Trump orchestrated this himself to become more popular. And yes, if you look back to someone like Ronald Reagan, an assassination attempt is likely to make him more popular. In fact, I would argue Argue that Trump just about has the White House sealed at this point. It's hard to think that he doesn't. But I would argue that it's not actually his doing, that it's likely the doing of whether it is, you know, one individual, one crazed individual who decided that he was going to try to take out Trump after all of this rhetoric that we heard about him. But on top of that, this also sends a very important message. And I know that there has been a lot of talk. We get to this every election year, right, where we sit here and we go, why don't we have a candidate who is truly anti-war, right, who is going to not just speak out and call 
call for an end to the U.S. support for the proxy war against Russia and Ukraine, but that is also against genocide in Gaza. That is against continuing on in this way as a U.S. empire that is bringing death and destruction all over the world. Why don't we see that as a prominent candidate? And for someone like Trump, right, he's someone who has raised questions, right? He has called out the deep state. He's called out these three-letter agencies. He's called out these endless wars around the world. And granted, while he hasn't, you know, gotten into office and drained the swamp the first time around, while he hasn't made good on a lot of his promises, and while we still look at those promises and think, yeah, okay, it's great that Trump will say all of this, but is he actually going to do anything? I think it is a reminder of the message that is sent out that even just one individual who is willing to ask those questions at that level, they could still be targeted, even if they are not going to do everything that they say that they're going to do on the campaign trail. So it, it definitely does send a warning to any of the other would-be candidates or any you know sort of activists within this country that are thinking, I really want to take on the deep state. I want to take on these three-letter agencies, and I want to change the course of where the United States is currently going. It's showing that they they are up against a lot and that that could even lead to the end of their lives at some point. Uh, that candidate could have been RFK Jr. Uh, indeed, on almost all issues, he is that candidate, but he's fatally compromised by his maniacal attachment to Netanyahu, to Likud, to the massacre in Gaza and so on. That will continue to bemuse me uh, for a long time to come. Does it puzzle you? It really does. And, you know, looking at someone like RFK Jr., he seemed to be kind of that anti-establishment candidate that a lot of Americans crave, right, where he's asking questions about Ukraine. He's going, wait a second, why is Congress signing off on, you know, $200 billion worth of support, yet we have no accountability, no transparency? And it seemed like he almost was that challenger. And then October 7th came. And any of the questions that a lot of us were asking, going, wait a second, Israel was warned about this. Wait a second. Israel had a lot of these plans in the books for some kind of greater Israel where they wanted to take over more and more land. They wanted to expel the Palestinian people from their land, and they are using this excuse as they're using rather this attack, excuse me, as an excuse to commit genocide in front of all of our eyes. While we all were sitting there and saying that, RFK Jr. was sitting there and defending Israel and defending U.S. support for Israel. He was being openly complicit in genocide and proud to do so. And I think that's the major sticking point that has plagued every major, I would say, po political candidate, at least in this race. Now, we have a few. We have, you know, Jill Stein for the Green Party, Chase Oliver for the Libertarian Party, who are speaking out, are calling it genocide and have been there. But if you notice, they're not getting a lot of media attention or coverage. However, people like Trump, right, who have been very outspoken in their support of Israel, have shown their support of Israel and have even referred to Biden as a bad Palestinian, as if that is some kind of a criticism that he should make of him. We also have Biden, who obviously right now is completely complicit in that genocide. I think it just goes to show that the U.S. has a major problem right now. And even as this week, I mean, you had intelligence officials coming out, and guess what? They're blaming about Russian interference in the upcoming election after blaming about interference from China and from Iran. And it's like they want to sit there and talk about foreign interference, yet they don't want to talk about interference coming from Israel, or they don't want to talk about how much money APAC fuels into every single member of Congress they can possibly get to, and how now, as in the case of Republican Congressman Thomas Massey, when you actually speak out and you challenge Israel, when you say that criticizing Israel is not anti-Semitism, they go after your challengers and they prop up your challengers to try to get you out of office. The U.S. has a, a lot of major issues, and I think that the assassination attempt against Trump is just one of those on a very long list that this country really needs to contend with. 
Is Joe Biden safe as nominee now, Rachel? Seems to me that if, uh, if uh, Trump looks unstoppable, then who else would want to be the one that got swept away in the Trump tsunami of 2024? You know, that is an interesting question. And I, I'm kind of in that place of thinking, well, it, it does look like Biden is safe, right? All he has to do is just get through November because you're right. Who wants to step out now and be the Democratic challenger? Who wants to be the person going up against Trump? I mean, we haven't seen the polls yet. I know that there are polls running right now and they are likely to show Trump with a significant lead. I am very curious to see though, how Democrats in this country will react because you had a lot of people yesterday that were watching this assassination attempt unfold and saying, oh, that, that must have been Trump's doing. He did it to himself to make him more popular. So my my question is, are they going to go out and to vote for Joe Biden or are they going to stay home and decide not to vote at all? But it'll be very interesting to see. I think a lot of that is almost up to just how much Joe Biden can get through. I mean, we saw this has been a truly disastrous week for the man as he was in a position of, I mean, he apparently thinks that Trump is his vice president and he thinks that Zelensky is President Putin and he can't seem to get any of these names straight. And it just causes a lot of concern about what he's able to get through. We do have that next president presidential debate coming up in September. So uh, a lot on the line here, but I know Democrats may be in a situation right now of thinking, thank goodness the media coverage has shifted to Trump because they don't have to talk about Biden and all of the concerns that they've been having yeah. to at least address and acknowledge about him lately. Just finally, uh, Rachel, what can you tell us about the alleged shooter? Uh, he can't tell us anything like Lee Harvey Oswald uh, in, a, in, in a police garage, he's stone dead. Uh, the uh, first name that we were given, fellow called Violet, uh, surname Violet, uh, he, he's disappeared. If you Google him now, you, you won't be able to get to that name. Uh, the name now is Thomas Crooks, age 20, pretty accurate rifle fire for a 20-year-old from a roof at 120 or 30 yards. Uh, he is said to be of Scottish and English uh, descent, uh, unfortunately for us. Uh, is he, are people actively trying to find out who he, how, who he is? I mean, the notion that he was a right winger who wanted to kill Trump because he wasn't right wing enough, will be laughed at by ordinary people around the world, I think. Uh, but what can you tell us about him, if anything? Yeah, the interesting thing is that he's also, much like Lee Harvey Oswald, he's also being referred to by three names as Thomas Michael Crooks. I'm not sure if that's just the media kind of throwing it out there or what's behind him. But yeah, a, a lot of confusion here. This seems to be this 20-year-old who was not even old enough to vote the last presidential election that we had. This would be his first presidential election coming up if he had made it to that point. I know it was being put out there that he had registered as a Republican, but there were also some reports that he had donated $15 to a pack a political action committee on Biden's inauguration day. Now, granted, a lot of reports, a lot of speculation going on out there. And so I think that given that it is still those early hours, we are likely to learn more about him. But I've seen the photos. You know, it seems like people are digging up grade school photos, high school graduation school photos, and putting all of that out on the internet. It doesn't seem like we have any kind of manifesto yet, which I would think, arguably, if you were someone who was going to attempt to assassinate the president of the United States, you would have some kind of message, some kind of this is why I did this. It doesn't seem like we have that, and I'm with you. It has been really confusing, not a lot of information put out there, and I'm not sure quite what's behind that and how much of this is just, again, going back to Secret Service and law enforcement trying to clean up this complete mess because it looks absolutely ridiculous to think that here in this country at a campaign rally like this one, they were not able to keep it completely secure and they were either 
either not on top of their game because they screwed up or not on top of their game because they willingly and allowed the former president who is now the front runner to be the next president allowed him to be almost assassinated again going back to that fact that if he had not moved his head he likely would not be with us today i've got to tell you quite eerily that picture that we just put up of Mr. Crooks, he even looks like Lee Harvey Oswald. Thanks very much, <laughs> Rachel Blevins, for your wisdom. Thanks for joining us.